And uh, I'll say a little more about that. So, uh, but I first I'd like to turn it over to Steve Link. Um, I can say uh, thank you for coming to the February meeting of the Columbia Basin chapter of the Washington Native Plant Society. I hope there are many of you out there hiding, but will reveal yourself at some point. We, we're going to have a pleasurable evening. I, it, the weather's been very nice. Things are starting to pop up and there are flowers around. So I plan on hiking this weekend and uh, enjoying that pleasure in this uncertain time. So beyond that, I'm gonna just turn this over to Janelle who has a lovely speaker for us here. Uh, yes, and welcome everybody. Really glad to see we have uh, such good attendance tonight. Um, excited to hear the talk. As I said before, uh, as we start out, everybody is uh, on mute and with no video. Um, and we ask that uh, you use the chat to uh, ask any questions and we'll answer them at the end of the presentation. Um, it seems to work best that way. Uh, at the end of the presentation, I'll try and bring everybody in uh, so that you can uh, talk and, uh, and you can ask your question directly or I can read them off the chat. So that's how we'll handle the logistics tonight. And now I'd um, like to just basically introduce our, our honored speaker. I'm really glad uh, to be able to uh, have Stephen Gunn here tonight uh, to talk to us. Um, basically about climate and climate change. And uh, I, I think uh, Stephen has done research on this topic for a long time and he's still a, uh, active uh, in advocating uh, at the community level um, regarding climate change. And I'm really eager to hear what he has to say. So with no further ado, I'll turn it over to Stephen. Okay, Janelle, I will share my screen here. There we go. So um, glad to uh, have this opportunity to speak to you. It's a, a, a great turnout. This is, I'm impressed. Um, what I'm going to cover tonight is um, what we can learn from the year 2015. And you may recall, if you were in the Northwest in 2015, this a very warm year, a very hot summer, very mild winter, and we had fires. And, um, but before I go into that, I'm going to give you a little um, tutorial on climate science, a very short, that uh, I hope you will um, learn something from. And then uh, we'll talk about 2015. So, here we go. All right, so um, in many ways, climate change is very complicated because the climate system, the earth, is, is very complicated. But in one sense, it's very simple. Uh, climate change is simply driven by changes in the heat content of the earth which are due to the imbalance of energy. If the amount of incoming sunlight that is absorbed by the climate system is not balanced exactly by the infrared heat emitted to space, then uh, the heat content of the Earth system changes. In the long term, there is a balance. Uh, but on the shorter term, if uh, there are changes in the solar luminosity, or in the brightness of the earth, or in the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, which affects infrared emission to space, then that will produce a, a uh, change in the heat content, and generally such that the, um, the climate system warms or cools so that the infrared heat um, can adjust and ultimately balance the absorbed solar energy again. So to illustrate this, um, this uh, chart here shows um, the heat content of the earth 
uh, in blue over the last uh, 50 years, uh, and also the global average surface temperature. And they're not the same. Uh, the surface temperature is just measures a very thin layer in the climate system. It doesn't measure the heat content of the deep ocean or the atmosphere or the land. And uh, so there are differences, but generally the global average surface temperature does follow the changes in the heat content. Um, there are shorter term fluctuations in the surface temperature, and those are associated with shifts in the heat content between the atmosphere and the ocean and the land. And what these are mostly is um, signatures of the El Nino phenomenon, where there's a warming in the tropical Pacific. And uh, you can actually see these changes in surface temperature are correlated pretty well with the El Nino index. But generally, as the heat content uh, increases in response to the accumulation of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the surface temperature does uh, increase, uh, albeit not monotonically. So I, whenever I speak uh, to the public about climate change, I always have to show the data from the ice core. Going back 800,000 years, uh, this figure goes back 450,000, 420,000 years. Um, and from one ice core. And uh, so it shows three things, temperature, methane, and CO2 concentrations. The temperature is estimated from the isotopes of oxygen in the water in the ice, um, the partitioning of water, of the oxygen in water into different isotopes depends upon the temperature at which the water condensed to form cloud, which ultimately gets deposited on Antarctica. And what you see in the temperature record is um, a wide range in temperature of about five degrees centigrade over the last 400,000 years. And quite a regular variation uh, as well. If you look at the most recent 10,000 years, that's, that's our present interglacial period, fairly stable climate. But then 20,000 years ago, it was much, much colder, five degrees colder. That was the depth of the last ice age. Going back 130,000 years ago, you see the previous interglacial, which is actually a little bit warmer than we are today. And you see a regular variation in temperature for a period of 100, 120,000 years um, in the temperature record. This regularity is driven by regular variations um, in the Earth's orbit, which affects how much sunlight shines on the Northern Hemisphere during winter. And so um, generally, if you get more um, sunlight shining on the Northern Hemisphere during winter, or during summer, I should say, during summer, that will tend to melt the snow and ice out faster. And that, um, that changes how much sunlight is absorbed by the Earth system and amplifies through this, what's it called ice albedo feedback, amplifies the warming driven purely by the changes in the Earth's orbit, which are actually quite small. Um, but there's a further amplification process associated with greenhouse gases, methane and CO2. Those concentrations vary strongly with temperature, highly correlated with temperature, correlation coefficient of more than 0.8 because of temperature dependent biological processes and physical processes, such as the solubility of CO2 in ocean water and uh, respiration rates. And so you tend to have more greenhouse gases when it's warmer. And uh, so they trap heat, reduce the amount of infrared uh, radiation to space. And so then we, the earth system accumulates heat and that warms up the surface. So um, now we have more recent data than these ice cores. The resolution of these ice core data is about 200 years. Oops, going the wrong way. Uh, the more recent data, CO2 has risen now up to 450 parts per million. And, C and methane has risen up um, to about 1800. So it's, it's more than double and CO2 has gone up about 45%. 
So on the basis of this data alone, you might expect temperature to um, rise quite a bit. It's only warmed about one degree so far, just because it takes time for the ocean to warm in response to the uh, imbalance of energy in the climate system. So um, we can look over the last 2000 years and see uh, the stability of, of carbon dioxide, methane, and another greenhouse gas, nitrous oxide, until uh, about 1800, when we started burning fossil fuels um, and human population grew. We had cows launching methane and uh, more rice paddies uh, emitting methane and starting to fertilize um, our farms emitting nitrous oxide. And so these greenhouse gas concentrations have shot up. And so, oops, I go the right direction. And so yeah, now our CO2 is at 415 parts per million. So that's, those are the real drivers in the last 200 years of the recent warming. Um, now, it turns out that the CO2 effect dominates. Um, I should go back and show that the concentrations of CO2 are in parts per um, million, and the concentrations of nitrous oxide and, and methane are in parts per, per, per billion. They are uh, low, much lower concentrations. They are more radiatively active uh, per molecule than CO2. So they do matter, just not as important as CO2. Now, CO2 is a very stable form of carbon, and so it has quite a lifetime in the climate system measured in decades to centuries. And so it really accumulates in the, in the climate system. And so the amount of warming we can expect from using CO2 is almost proportional to the accumulated emissions of CO2 since 1870. And that's shown in the here, showing the warming versus the um, emissions since 1870. Um, and so um, we can expect, well, as first show, I should also point out the, the black line is the, the data showing a warming of about one degree by 2010 and about um, 400 um, gigatons of carbon emitted. Um, and then how much it warms depend, then depends upon how much we emit. There are different emission scenarios that um, produce different amounts different concentrations, different accumulations of CO2 uh, in the atmosphere out to 2100. And so we can achieve a warming of, of four degrees if we emit a lot. So it's really up to us to how much we emit and how much warm we're going to get. Okay, and we have a lot of fossil fuel reserves of carbon available. Um, this uh, figure shows different uh, reservoirs, the oil sands in Canada, the conventional oil we've been burning in our cars, and then unconventional oil, that's fracking and conventional and unconventional gas. So the, the fracking has opened up a lot of, of um, reserves. Coal uh, dominates, and we have, we have enough of the fossil fuels to warm the planet by more than 15 degrees C which would really cook us. So we definitely have to leave a lot of this in the ground. The red line shows uh, where we are in terms of warming. And so we have plenty to go well past um, the warming that we've experienced. And so we really do need to make a conscious decision to leave most of these uh, resources in the ground. And there are technologies to replace the fossil fuels. I'm not gonna talk about those. Um, unless you really want me to. Okay, so as I said, the, the carbon is accumulating in the atmosphere and the climate system. And so if we want to stop global warming, we have to really bring the emissions down to zero. These different curves show emissions over this century for different scenarios. Um, the uh, pledges here, the red curve here is the pledges from the Paris Climate Accord in 2015, and that would limit warming to about two and a half degrees centigrade, it start to bring the emissions down, but to really to limit warming to one and a half or two degrees 
is we have to bring the emissions down uh, to zero and even negative, start pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere. So that's really uh, the challenge is to bring those emissions um, down near zero. Okay, so I'm gonna talk now about some of my own work. Uh, when I was at Pima Nell, uh, I uh, developed with others global climate models and use them to simulate future climate change. This is a climate simulation with a special model that I developed with a innovative way of representing uh, local topographic effects on, on the climate. It's a global simulation, but I'm just showing you the Western US because that's our area of interest. And um, so the top row is the observations. And then the bottom row is the simulation um, for uh, late uh, 20th century. And so you see that the uh, simulation captures a lot of the spatial structure of precipitation, temperature, and uh, snow water. Uh, there are some, some biases that I could go into, but um, it does tend to um, under simulate uh, snow water during March um, when there's the most snow. And it does tend to miss the rain shadow um, in the Eastern Washington, Eastern Oregon, doesn't do rain shadows quite so well. So that's something to keep in mind. Okay, so now I'm going to apply this model to a simulation of future ring. Um, and I'm picking one an emission area called the A1B. It's rather like that Paris emissions uh, scenario, which has the emissions starting to go down after 2040 or so, but not down very much. And I'm simulating the period from 1977 to 2100. And I'll be focusing on the difference between the last two decades of this century and the last century, um, just to focus our attention. So it's a fairly modest attempt to uh, limit warming. Just keep that in mind. Okay, so uh, here we have the changes in the Western US. And first we'll start with the annual temperature. There's not much spatial structure here. It's generally a fairly broad uniform warming of about three degrees centigrade across the Western US and globally really. So three degrees centigrade of warming. Um, on the upper left uh, corner, we have the change in annual precipitation, annual mean precipitation millimeters per day. These changes are fairly small. Um, they're less than uh, a half a millimeter per day. Uh, to get a better sense uh, of this, I've shown in the bottom left corner, the ratio of the precipitation rate at the end of this century um, versus uh, the last two decades of the last century. And here, so this ratio is gonna be close to one for a little change. And the white area is uh, within a 5%, just a less than 5% difference uh, in the precipitation rates. Uh, so first change precipitation. The light colors are a 10% difference. So most of the US is less than a 10% change in precipitation. So not much change in precipitation. Now let's go over to snow water. The upper right uh, panel shows uh, the change in snow water for the two sets of periods. And what you see is um, not much change in places where it doesn't get much snow, of course, but fairly large changes of more than uh, tenth of a meter or more than 10 centimeters in snow cover in the Cascades here and a smaller reduction in the, the Sierras. Um, and uh, in terms of a ratio in the lower right here, you see that the, the ratio is um, quite small um, in the drier places. In the mountains, um, in the Cascades, it's um, between 0.1 and 0.5. Uh, well, it's a, it's a 10, 10 to 50% reduction in, in the uh, 
um, Northern Cascades. And in the Southern Cascades, it's uh, more than a 50% reduction. And you see reductions of uh, 10 to 3% in the mountains of, of uh, central Idaho. Um, and then in the Sierras, a reduction of, of 10 to 30%. Um, it's a little hard to get a sense of that. So an, another way of looking at it is to average over all of the Western US, the amount of snow water. Uh, and following that, um, every year uh, of this simulation. And so what you see is that there's lots of ups and downs from year to year. That's just weather effects, but clearly a downward trend about uh, a 60 to 70 percent reduction in the average snow water in the Western US. Uh, so that's a very dramatic uh, reduction for even for a, a modest attempt to limit the warming. Um, and so you can divide that 60% loss by a three degree C of warming and you get about a 20% loss in snow water per degree of warming. So let's look at what the data shows us now. Uh, we have a network of snow telemetry stations in the mountains that measure snow water using a, a pillow measuring the weight of the water. And that's measured for the purposes of managing uh, irrigation resources. And we have data going back to 1955, and this shows the trends in the uh, April snowpack in percent um, over that period. The red circles are uh, uh, reductions. The larger the circle, the larger the reduction. The biggest circle is 80% reduction. Then the blue circles are where it has increased. And you see some stations where it has increased, but most stations it has decreased, and often on more than 40%. So we're seeing large reductions in the April snowpack in the Western US. So uh, that is consistent with the model, what the model is showing. So that means that we, if we have less mountain snowpack, uh, then the snow is going to melt out earlier. And then we're going to have less water uh, for irrigation during the summer. And uh, um, that is illustrated in this figure here, which is a modeling study. And it shows that for uh, historical 20th century conditions, that the Yakima River uh, maximum discharge uh, was uh, in June. Um, but as we go uh, later and later in this century, that maximum shifts earlier and earlier in the year until later in this century, it's in February. And uh, we can look at the same sort of results in the data, I'll see. I'm just going to show that later. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we're going to see this later in the data in 2015. Okay, so now let's go on to 20, 2015. And uh, what happened in 2015 was, in some sense, a manifestation of global warming. There was this huge blob of warm water off the west coast of North America, uh, about a three degree uh, anomaly. In ocean surface temperature. Um, and that uh, had huge impacts on uh, the Northwest. So, uh, and it lasted most of the year. So during the winter, much more of the winter precipitation fell as rain rather than snow. And, uh, and that's shown in this figure uh, here showing um, the snow tell data in at the end of March of 2015. And uh, what it shows, uh, almost all of the stations is, is red, which is a 25% of normal snowpack. A few stations are in the 50% range. Um, but yeah, a large reduction in the mountain snowpack. Uh, and so that snow melted out early and uh, led to uh, diminished uh, flow in, in the summertime. This is the Tianue River in August of 2015. 
And uh, you can go get um, river discharge data and plot it here. And I have two curves here. The brown curve is the climatological average discharge uh, at Union Gap uh, from uh, the last 20 years uh, for each month and shows the peak discharge is in May, uh, not June as um, that other simulation show, but pretty, pretty late in the spring. Um, and then the yellow curve is the data for 2015 showing lo and behold, the maximum in February. So it's a very similar result to what that climate simulation was showing uh, at the end of this century. So uh, 2015 is a good analog for what would become more common at the end of this century in terms of water resources. Uh, and I should say, um, the, the water resource managers knew about how much, how little water there was in the snowpack. And Scott Ravel, who manages the um, Rosa Irrigation District, had to make a tough call. He knew there was very little water in the mountains and that if he allowed uh, the farmers access to the usual amount of May irrigation water uh, that they were used to, that um, they wouldn't have enough in the reservoirs to provide irrigation during July and August. So he made the tough call of, shut, of shutting down Rosa Canal during the month of May, conserving that water uh, so that it was available for irrigation in uh, June and July. Um, but still, there were uh, there was major crop uh, damage. Um, fruit trees died and agricultural damage. Washington still. $700 million. Um, so serious economic impact there. And then of course, uh, once the snow melted out, uh, and it was a dry, a very hot summer, as you may recall, the uh, soil dried, the vegetation dried, and then when lightning struck, the wildfires spread fast and covered huge areas. This is the Okanagan complex. It was the largest uh, wildfire in Washington State's history. It would have been bigger. It would have burned this area down here, except for that it had burned the previous year, the Carlton complex fire in 2014. That was the previous biggest wildfire in Washington State history. So um, yeah, the uh, wildfires, spread further when the soil and vegetation is drier. And of course, uh, the, the heat also warmed the rivers. Uh, this is, I think near the, near the Columbia River, near the uh, Blue Bridge in the Columbia River, 66 sturgeon turned up dead because of the warm water. And there was all sorts of smoke that caused problems too. Okay, so what can we learn from 2015 about native plants? Well, I looked, I looked on the internet for papers written about this subject, and yeah, the the 2015 had lots of wildfires. I didn't show all of them, um, but lots of wildfires that burned the forests and the understory um, destroyed a lot of of vegetation. Um, but it, I, I haven't seen any studies of the more subtle effects of climate change on native plants. And so the best source really is this review paper by uh, Dave Peterson, Becky Kearns, and Eric uh, Dodson for the National Forest Service. It was published in 2014, so it doesn't have any results from the 2015 fire and what's happened since then. We've had a lot of smoke since then too. But it is uh, really a nice uh, study. And so I'm gonna show some results of that. Um, and so I'd just like to first start with looking at um, the various different mechanisms by which uh, climate change can impact uh, native plants. And so the first is the direct impact on photosynthesis and generally um, 
we know that a warming does increase photosynthesis, um, which is good for plants. The, the uh, chemical process is, it is faster when it's warmer. Um, and, and similarly, a, a longer growing season in a warmer climate um, is beneficial for plants. But if we have a uh, diminished snowpack um, and then depleted soil water, then that is clearly going to uh, be hard on uh, a lot of the plants that are used to getting uh, that snow melt. And evapotranspiration is, is increased in a warmer, a warmer climate as a way as the surface um, losing heat is, is done more by evapotranspiration than by sensible heat or radiation. So with more evapor evapotranspiration, that's, um, that hurts the plants as well. Now, what's called CO fer CO2 fertilization is when the, uh, the stomates of the plant don't have to open as much to get the CO2 the plants need. And so they lose less uh, water by, by evaporation. And so that is uh, good for the plants. Um, and then precipitation, we don't really know. Uh, as I showed, the, there's, there's little impact in precipitation. Some models simulate an increase, some a decrease. We don't really know how precipitation will respond in uh, the Western US. We certainly know the phase will change, but not the amount of precipitation. Um, but of course, the biggie is the disturbances in a warmer uh, climate. You have the bark beetles, seem to, pro to proliferate and they destroy the trees. There's more disease destroying trees and more wildfires uh, driven by the, the depletion of soil water and the drying of the vegetation. And that's a, that's a huge impact. So we have this, this, these disturbances which can happen within you know, a matter of weeks uh, having a huge detrimental effect. The other more subtle effects are, are generally uh, more beneficial. And so which one is going to dominate uh, depends upon um, where you're at, I would say. And so uh, yeah, show um, in the Pacific Northwest, um, show fire area and insect disease area. This is not a change, this is just for um, 96 to 2008, I think. Um, so it doesn't show the, um, the big wildfires in 2014, 2015, but it does show a widespread infestation of the insects, particularly on the uh, eastern side of the Cascade Range. Lots of, of disease and insect there. And then the fires, of course, tend to be east of the mountains as well. Um, now the bottom figure is a model projections, not data. And it's uh, using, it's, it's estimating the increase in area burn for a two degree warming uh, from a simulation. And uh, you know, it's just huge increases um, in fire spread. Um, I mean, hundreds of percent. So very serious um, impact on fires. Um, Peterson also looked at um, some results from some um, landscape model simulations. Uh, and this shows uh, Ponderosa pine habitat. The upper row is for the current climate and the bottom row is in the century. And uh, these are driven by uh, climate simulations by different climate models. And the first four columns generally show a reduction in the habitat but the last one shows quite an increase. So I don't know how much I would trust that last one. It just seems hard to believe. But um, so some a reduction in Ponderosa pine. And uh, this table shows a summary for a worst case scenario. This is a very extreme case at the end of the century. So a lot of warming and the uh, response of different biomes. So the subalpine forests generally uh, loss or different species from uh, moderate to total loss. And then the maritime coniferous forest also loss um, 
in some cases, no change, but in most cases, uh, major to total loss. And then the dry coniferous forests on the east side of the mountains also um, loss uh, for most species. Um, there's one exception, uh, one study found a moderate to major gain. So um, yeah, there still is some uncertainty there. Um, and uh, so Peterson concludes in uh, with, um, he just discusses experimental studies um, where they artificially uh, enhance CO2 and look at the response. Um, and that does show different responses for different types of vegetation, C3 and C4. But those are very controlled um, conditions and doesn't represent the full complexity of ecosystems. Um, they, they do conclude that um, the subalpine forests may be most vulnerable to climate change. And that surprised me. I would have thought that the increase in growing season would um, uh, add to more, more trees at subalpine uh, altitudes. Um, but then little uh, agreement for the dry uh, coniferous forests. They also looked at shrub steppe biome and not much has been done there. Um, it's more precipitation controlled and we're not really sure how much precipitation is gonna change in the shrub steppe biome. So can't say too much there in the mid Columbia here. Now, um, I, 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 I'm sorry, I, I, I talk to the public a lot and I always have to, to give them some hope about how we can um, limit the warming. And so, um, I always advocate a policy that has the potential to uh, reduce emissions a lot um, without harming the economy. So it's politically feasible. And that is putting a fee on the carbon content of fuels, uh, fossil fuels um, at the source as close to the possible to the mine or the well or imports from other countries. Collect that steadily increasing fee in treasury and then return all of it back to the economy as an equal dividend to every, every person. So you have this price signal that is increasing that um, motivates consumers and utilities to reduce their carbon emissions. And then you have this dividend that um, people will go out and spend and that stimulates the economy and keeps everything pretty little impact on the economy, except there's a shift, of course, away from fossil fuels and into carbon free or carbon light activities. And so that's the policy that has um, been introduced in Congress in the last Congress and will certainly be introduced in the present Congress this year. And so um, we have a, a Tri-Cities chapter with more than 500 uh, members uh, now, and there's about 200,000 members uh, worldwide, most of them in the US. Canada is quite strong, and actually Canada has adopted this uh, policy as their, their national policy now. And you can learn more about that policy at energyinnovationact.org. So I'm not sure how much time I took, but um, that is my talk. So I, I suspect there's plenty of time for questions. So um, you can unmute people and I'd be happy to take uh, your questions as best I can. I'm not, not a plant uh, person, although I love wildflowers and I know some, some wildflowers names, um, but I'm sure you know a lot more than I do. Thanks so much, Steve. Um, I'm, I'm working to to uh, get folks unmuted and get their videos on. Um, yeah, and uh, uh, I should talk, Denise, is there an easy way to, to automatically get everybody back in the webinar or well, I think what we should do is perhaps take a QA and a in the, in the chat. chat. Um, I currently don't see any questions. 
Um, you might just uh, tell people where to find the chat and, and or Q&A stuff. So okay. folks should see on your bottom toolbar uh, an icon that says chat. And you can go ahead and type your questions right there in the chat. Say hello to each other. Um, if some of you have a question and you would like to speak, you may click on raise your hand. And we can, um, from there, give you a mic. Uh, Becky Drew says, thank you so much, Steve Gann. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> so if you um, want to, I guess what I should say is if you want to raise your hand, here's someone here, Darcy. So we'll promote Darcy to a panelist. And those of you that would like to come in to be a part of a conversation, you can raise your hand and come on in as a panelist and you'll be visible just like Janelle and Mickey is today. Hi, Darcy, we see you. Hi. Please raise your hand if you'd like to join us. <laughs> yes, where's my hand? <laughs> But we can hear you, Darcy. <laughs> can you hear me? Okay. I can't find the yeah. hand to raise. It was there a minute ago, but I don't see it now. Anyway, my question is, there's a, a, a lot of controlled burn planning going on, especially in Eastern Washington. And um, I really, how, how is that going to contribute to the, well, the, the air, the pollution, which is, you know, pretty terrible during fire season um, in Walla Walla already, because uh, we get it from Canada, we get it from California, and then we get our own local fires too. Um, so I'm, I'm really wondering about the long-term viability of uh, fires mm. in the forest as a, as a mechanism for controlling fires in the forest? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So um, when you talk to the public about fires, you very often get a question like that. And, and often, more often I would say is posed as a, well, you know, it's not about climate change, it's about forest management. That um, we've been suppressing fires yeah. for the last century or more now, and that has allowed the understory to build up. So when we get a fire, it just has all sorts of fuel and um, becomes a raging inferno. And um, I always tell them, no, you're right. Mm -hmm. but that has contributed to the problem. It doesn't mean that the warming uh, also uh, isn't uh, contributing to it. And so that is, interest and indeed some funding now to manage our forests differently. And the, the notion, that I think it goes back to native practices uh, with prescribed burns and the natives apparently knew how to start fires, when to start fires that would not become a raging inferno. They do it earlier in the year when it's just dry enough to burn the understory and not catch the big trees on fire and burn uh, at a more, more gradual rate. And so that's the, the notion. Um, and so we'll see what comes of it. Um, people have been clearing forests. Some, some areas you see all the understory has been cleared out and, and stacked in piles. Um, that's another way, but that's a very labor intensive practice. So I expect we'll see more of these prescribed burns in the off season, uh, whatever, we have left of the off season. <laughs> California doesn't have much of an off season, I think. But um, that's that's the notion, and so hopefully that'll help because you know these last uh, six years have just been awful. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. We've got some more questions in the chat box. I'm just going to take them in order right now. We've got from. Um, I think it's Ginny and Steve 
uh, Tuckerman say, ask the climate models assume uh, the same weather patterns. Um, what potential is there for major disruptions of the key stream and Southern Ocean oscillations? And Ginny and Steve, hopefully you're, um, you may be able to talk now. Yeah, okay. So the climate models are, they're really just weather models a couple to ocean models and land models. And they, they allow the weather to uh, vary in response to everything that affects weather, including uh, carbon dioxide. And so they simulate Southern Oscillation and Arctic Oscillation and all, El Nino's and all these different things. Um, those, you know, those events are not predictable for time scales of, of of years. Um, and so they're not getting the timing of these oscillations correct, but they're getting the variability associated. Um, and so, um, and that's important because we need to know um, that, that that variability produces uncertainty in our estimates of how um, the climate responds to the change in, in the greenhouse gases. Does that answer your question? So, Jenny or Steve, you, you should be able to unmute if you wanted to wanted to uh, answer Steve or, or ask a further question. Okay. Um, well, we'll go ahead to the next question for now. We have one from Matt. Um, I may not say this correctly, from Matt Dybala. Uh, does the water lost over time in uh, snowpack and rivers attribute to rise, attribute to, or contribute to rising ocean levels of concern on the Pacific coast? Okay, yeah, good question. So what the, um, the water managers are measuring is uh, the seasonal snowpack. These are locations that uh, aren't so high that the snow doesn't melt every year. Um, there are, of course, glaciers at higher elevations that are melting away. Glacier Peak or Glacier Wilderness, Glacier National Park will not have glaciers in another 50 years. And glaciers all over the place are losing mass. And that melting is contributing to sea level rise. It's, um, it's, maybe 30% of the sea level rise so far. Um, another third is from the thermal expansion of the water and then another third is from the uh, ice mass on Greenland uh, for the most part melting. Um, ultimately the loss from Greenland and Antarctica will dominate but in the present century yeah the, the losing the glaciers on land um, are affecting sea level rise. The potential isn't that great. Uh, it's more of the Greenland ice um, and Antarctic ice. If all the Greenland were to melt, uh, that would raise sea level by uh, 60 feet. But that would take a thousand years. Wow. Uh, well, thank you. Thanks for answering that. Mm -hmm. I guess, you know, one part of my question in general was that the water cycle on the earth, it's, it's a closed system because I, I, I have a hard time just not, you know, with evapotranspiration, just, you know, really becoming more of an issue on our, in our summer months, losing more water, uh, moisture in the land. Uh, it's just hard to me believe that we don't lose water in the Earth's cycle, but I guess is it is it a closed system that we truly if we're losing water on land, it ends up in the ocean? Is it as simple as that, or is that yeah, it, yeah, more it, complicated than that? It, <laughs> probably it in the atmosphere, it rains out, and some of it gets recycled on land, but you know ultimately it does go into the ocean. So it's all a closed system, and 
well, then of course there was the aquifers that were drawing out too. So that's a different thing, but, um, and the climate models don't, they don't simulate the aquifer effects. I think they're starting to, but not yet. Thanks. Uh, there's another question in the chat from Heidi Center. Uh, Heidi, do you want to unmute and ask your question or would you prefer I ask it? I can ask, thank you. Yeah, I just wondered, uh, you mentioned that the, the models for change in precipitation in the Eastern you know, Washington and the whole shrub step, shrub step area uh, is kind of uncertain. And so it's hard to predict what, you know, if, if there will be more or less. So I'm wondering why that is, maybe you said, and I missed it. I didn't say, um, there, there are some rules of thumb um, that people have put forward and they, they may or may not hold. Uh, some people have suggested that the wet, in, as the climate warms, the wet places will get wetter and the dry places will get drier. And that's probably true for some places, but not all places. Um, we're not seeing that consistently in Eastern Washington. Um, the models are not perfect, you know, they don't represent the rain shadow very well. Um, and maybe the effect is, is, is pretty small. We, we know, but we do know that um, this area was moister uh, during the last ice age, but that's going in a different direction. So uh, perhaps it'll get drier here. Um, certainly the, the vegetation will get drier just because ET increases, but the precipitation, hard to say. I just, I don't have, I don't like to talk about precipitation because it's hard. Um, yeah. I have a question yeah. for everybody um, before I take a question from you. Um, where is this photo taken from? Where do you think it's taken from? Um, it's all um, bitter brush. So uh, foothills outside of Yakima or Ellensburg? Or is it in the state? <laughs> I'll give you a clue. It's not in the state. Not in the state. Okay. Yeah. Then there's a whole bunch of places it could be. <laughs> Name some. Nevada. Uh, yeah, it could be parts of uh, Nevada, uh, southern Idaho on the Snake River Plateau or above Boise. Um, Wyoming. Wyoming. No. Great Basin. Okay, I won't. I won't. Is it in this one. hemisphere, Steve? It's, uh, <laughs> it's from Russia. Well, well, that's no fair. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, another question. Uh, well, I, you know, I, I, just, I have heard that we that we hear in this part of eastern Washington and the Pacific Northwest are on the same parallel as parts of Russia. Oh. Okay. They do have steps, so yeah. I had a follow on kind of a follow on comment or question for you, Steve, on Heidi's where we were talking about, I, I know the uncertainty in predicting precipitation in all the climate models, whether they're regional or global is, is real high. But um, I thought there were, could you say, tell me whether that, well, there are predictions that the timing of the precipitation is going to change for uh, certainly for our region that we would have less wintertime precipitation and more spring and early summer precipitation. And is, is that something you've heard of or you have any idea whether that's a, um, a more robust prediction at all? I, I haven't heard that. Um, okay. I, I don't know if I believe it. <laughs> 
really? Okay. Yeah. I don't know why. I, don't, I can't think of a physical reason to expect that. I'll just say that. Okay. There's more questions in the chat, if I can get back there. And folks, I think I've, um, everybody that I could uh, allow to talk, I did. Some of you folks have an uh, older version um, of the Zoom webinar, and so it, it wouldn't let me, uh, but um, if you if you uh, raise your hand or want to ask your question, I think the next question that I have here is from Gretchen Graber um, asking about, do you want to ask that question, Gretchen, or you'd have to unmute. Or I'll, I'll ask it for a real quick. Just, just ask it. Yeah, just go ahead and ask it. I don't. <laughs> okay, you're here now. <laughs> okay, go. Uh, wondered whether you could estimate the hottest day of the year in the Columbia Basin in 2100. Thank, and says thank you. But kind of how, what extreme uh, temperature might, might we see in 2100? Uh, yeah, so assuming uh, the three degree warming holds throughout the year, then we see warming warmer than, than uh, well, it's already warmed one degree. So two more, two C warming. That's where uh, this, this um, Paris climate um, agreement sort of scenario um, could be more, could be less. Hopefully it'd be less. Nikki, you're, the, you're next in line. You know, mine is more of a general question. We could just leave it to the end. I mean, it's just, uh, I don't expect Steve to be able to answer that question. <laughs> Maybe it's a discussion it's, point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Wendy asked a question. Wendy McClure. So Wendy, Wendy's questioning what the, if there's a known cause of the the heat blob off the coast in 2015, uh -huh. if it can be attributed to a particular cause. Ah, uh, great question, Wendy. Um, I have not read of any explanation for the cause. It's, I, you know, it could be uh, a lot of things. It could be some heat. Um, coming up from further down in the ocean. It could be some uh, changes in clouds that allowed more sunlight to be absorbed, a reduction in cloud that allowed more sunlight to be absorbed. I have not read of an explanation. Uh, I have not seen any simulation of it. Um, the climate has, the climate system has all sorts of modes of variability. Um, that we are still learning about. And I just think it's fascinating that we see that sort of a manifestation of warming. Um, and it's really a teachable moment for us. So uh, it's a yeah, fascinating phenomenon. And I don't know if it'll appear again. You know, it's just a lot of things we don't understand about atmosphere-ocean interactions. Was it, weren't there some other instances of something similar like a year or so later, more or less just off the Pacific coast, kind of similar area? Nothing that big. Um, no, huh? Yeah. I mean, there are, there are always going to be ocean surface temperature anomalies all over the place. But that was really a big one, okay. uh, in, both in size and magnitude. Hey. Thanks. The, next, we have a, a question from Steve Richmond, and, and I don't know if you're on, Steve, but I'm going to go ahead and read it, but please free, feel free to, to jump in. Um, Steve Richmond says that you've mentioned fuel loads, uh, and I think this is a, maybe a tough question for a number of us. You mentioned fuel, have mentioned fuel loads, but wood in contact and under soil supports mycelium transfer of moisture to plants. Has there been research about logging roads as a tourniquet on fungal networks and consequential fire susceptibility? And since I'm a, I've done all my research in the shrub step, I 
I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> and I sure don't. That's that's outside <laughs> my, my expertise. Is anyone if anyone knows Forrest, maybe they could raise a hand and say something. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting question, but I I haven't seen that in uh, seen that uh, in any any conference talks or anything, and I certainly haven't looked for it. Um, Steve Link, do you have you heard anything? No, on that? I could see tree roots maybe extending underneath the road and uh, might carry some mycelia along with it. Uh, but it's an effect. Who knows? It's a good research question. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. That might be the last question that I see in the chat. Does anybody else like to raise their hand or unmute themselves if they can? And yeah, I would. Okay, oh, go right ahead. Okay. I, I did ask a question. I don't know if you saw it, but oh. I, I'm somewhat becoming involved with trying to restore um tannum oh, buckwheat. Yeah. And <clears throat> I'm a little concerned about, you know, can you give any comfort to where the precipitation reduction could be in the next hundred years? Is this close to noise? Is it uh, likely to be a little drier? Or I'm curious. Well, I mean, I would say even, I mean, even without a change of precipitation, you're going to have more evaporative stress. True. To, to deal with. So I would go with that because I, yeah, I, I don't have confidence in precipitation prediction, but you know, physiologically, there's going to be more ET. That is true. Cool. Yeah, sorry, I skipped your question, Steve. No. <laughs> So, Mickey, you had uh, a question you wanted to say for a while. I was just kind of curious whether Steve Richmond, who asked about the mycelium transfer in, in roads, whether he had any knowledge, information. I, I mean, it kind of piqued my curiosity, too, a little bit, what the basis is. I've read that there's huge networks of mycelium, like up in BC. Uh, they've studied some of the forests up there and how it's a really important transmittal of information essentially but i don't know about moisture so i was just curious if he knew more so am i the only yeah. one here who doesn't know what mycelium is <laughs> <laughs> so um, i don't know if you can hear me though this, this is steve richmond i just was able to uh chat now so am yeah, i on you're here. You're yes on. yeah can I've, hear you. I've been thinking about this question since the fern die off in Seward Park, uh, which seems to be rel related to um, moisture and, and then the drought after 2015. And after the rains come ba came back, the uh, ferns seemed to perk up. So I just theorized that the roads around Seward Park, which are adjacent to Lake Washington, um, are a tourniquet on uh, fungal networks, which have been showed through radioisotope studies to uh, connect to a riparian zone and go 100 yards, 200 yards up into the upland mm -hmm. and feed a hemlock on a log suspended in air. So there's, you know, if you think of mycelium like our capillaries, uh, you know, we have water that goes through our system, but then the capillaries um, sort of uh, transport it out to all of our you know, tissues. So um, mycelium is the body of the fungus. So it, it, it uh, seeks mm -hmm. out plants because it needs the photosynthesis. So I, I just imagine that when we tourniquet and, and cut off these fungal networks, we're actually making our forests uh, more prone to drying out. Mm -hmm. and, and mycelium also has uh, antimicrobial properties. So we're going to have more diseases, possibly. Mm. I may have been cutting out. I'm not hearing anything. No, no, I, we're, I'm nodding. I was really okay. thought of, like Steve Link, I thought this was really an interesting research question. And uh... Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Steve, is that related as well to the big leaf maple issues? Die-offs uh, or sicknesses? Uh, Steve Richmond or Steve Gone? 
Steve Richmond. I'm sorry, Steve. Well, <laughs> um, I'm I'm not a scientist, just a practitioner, and I I theorize a lot, and I also wonder about um, moisture content, humidity in the air, and whether that creates uh, you know, you see more mildew issues on leaves, particularly with big leaf maple, and I don't know if that's related. Um, so I just notice changes and I wonder why. So this is why I'm here listening. <laughs> well, it's an interest, interesting topic, topic for sure. Okay. Well, um, thank you. Thank you. I, I always thought I was alone in the woods, but it's nice to know <laughs> it resonates with people. <laughs> it does. Okay. <laughs> Well, if, if we don't, I don't know if there's other questions or other comments that people wanted to make. Did you want to go back to your question, Nikki, about the clearing, burning the understory? Are you thinking prescribed fire and what effect that has on, on the wildlife? Yeah, I just had been curious about, because I kind of had heard that, you know, that was one of the tactics they were considering using or are using, I'm not sure which. And I just wondered if any, you know, so that's, good for the fires, good for the trees. I wondered, since I like to focus on the smaller things, whether, you know, what what, hap what effect does that have on all the rest of the network that you're tearing out to help prevent big wildfires, you know, or clearing or cutting down or whatever. It seems like the animals and birds that and insects that need those plants are being strongly affected by that. Not as affected as by a big wildfire, but, um, if you're doing it consistently and consistently removing that habitat, I just wondered what happens to the network of things. And I wondered if anybody had any ideas, heard anything, whatever, I don't know. Um, it, it really depends on the, on the forest type and, the, and which wildlife you're, you're talking about, because sometimes, um, sometimes it, it can be beneficial in terms of the types of regrowth that you might get might be more palatable for, you know, browsing ungulates and things like that. Uh, the other thing I'd say is often prescribed burns are relatively small in comparison um, to these, you know, the wildfires that we're trying to prevent. Not that I'm necessarily a, the big fan of prescribed burning, but it in forest systems, um, I think they they have done quite a bit of research on that. Uh, I I don't know, Wendy. Maybe you could speak to how prescribed burns affect. Maybe maybe we don't do prescribed burns in areas that we know we have sensitive plants in or rare plants. Um, I guess I'm not all that familiar with some of the Forest Service and BLM practices. Um, The, the timing of prescribed burns can be an issue too for uh, you don't want to do them in the spring when and during nesting season you want to do them in the fall for the most part I don't know if Wendy's still if yeah, until Wendy answers I hope <laughs> um, there was a I don't think I've I've passed the information along yet because I didn't think the link was available yet, but the, to the last of the series of webinars on fire in the shrub step. And um, it was a series uh, put together by WashingtonFireAdapted.org or, or something, something like that. I'm sorry, I don't really remember the details and I don't have them here with me. Um, but we'll put something on our Facebook page with a link to these. I think there were like five webinars. One of them talked about impact of fire on um, uh, threatened and endangered species. One talked about prescribed burns and, uh, and other impacts related to the shrub step. And that those are the only two that I can think of offhand. But it was a really interesting so you, they've recorded them all and they're available to, for you to go and browse through. We'll put it on Facebook soon. I need to get it there. <laughs> Anyone else with comments or questions or? I, I had a question, Paula Clark. I don't have my video up, but um, uh, 
I know, Steve, that you've talked to uh, some of our congressional representatives and so forth, uh, Dan Newhouse in particular, about the potential effects on agriculture of the global warming. And that um, my impression was that he seemed to be receptive somewhat to that. Um, what, what it seems like it's so hard to predict, what are you expecting and, and what might uh, they be worried about? What might the agriculture industry be worried about here? I know it's not a native plant question, but. Yeah, so, um, you know, as I said, we're looking at a 60, 70% reduction in mountain snowpack and 70% of the runoff in the Western US is from snowmelt and so losing yeah. 70% of that, you, you, you lost half of your irrigation water in the summer. And so that is going to um, force either um, adding more artificial reservoirs or um, using uh, crops that, that, that don't require as much water. There is a Yakima watershed management plan to uh, raise the level of bumping lake reservoir to manage uh, Kachis differently and to mm -hmm. um, build a, a little reservoir up one of the canyons of off of the Yakima Canyon between Ellensburg and Yakima. We're pumping water up into that reservoir during the spring and having it then available in the summer. And I think also pumping water underground. A lot of different things to enhance the um, artificial storage of water. And the price tag for that is four to five billion dollars for that watershed. And um, so there's quite a quite a large cost to that, but there's you know, a lot at stake too. And, and so uh, funding is coming forward for that watershed. Of course, there's lots of other watersheds that need similar sort of um, remediation. So yeah. And then, there's a heat effects independent of water. Yeah, things like apples and uh, some of the tree fruits are subject to actually sunburn and <laughs> yeah. heat effects to keep them from actually ripening. Yeah. Uh, and maybe looking at maybe trying to switch over to other varieties, maybe even to get, mm -hmm. get past the effects of climate change. So uh, Marianne has uh, put a link to the fire webinars in the chat box. So if Good. that's the one you're thinking of, Nikki. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Fire adapted. Yep. Fireadaptedwashington.org. So if you're interested in looking at those. Uh, any other comments or questions from folks? Okay, I'm not I'm not seeing any more in the chat or in the in the question and answer. So I'd like to take I, I do have an announcement too, but I first want to really thank Steve for taking time to talk to us and giving us all that data together. Hey. Um, I really uh, enjoyed seeing it and seeing those uh, predictions out to 2100. 